Er is Papa Alfa No Eco Tingo Eco voor de Daily Minutes met een nieuwsupdate voor vandaag 31 juli 2016. Dit is het bulletin van zondag. As always on Sundays, our bulletin is in English. We do have Morse code today and an image which is in PD90 because of a huge difference in quality between the PD50 and PD90 versions of this picture. We will start with some propagation news and after that we will start with a new item of ARLs the doctor is in which handles the use of balance. Because the first part of the series is rather difficult to split in several parts, the bulletin today will be roughly two minutes longer than normal. And now the DX News, compiled from 425 DX News and other sources. Tom Callas, Kilo Charlie Zero Whiskey, continues from Tuvalu as Tango 2 Charlie Oscar Whiskey until the 18th of August. He'll be on CW only on HF, including the 6 metre band, running 500 watts into vertical antennas over salt water. Theodorus Sierra Victor 1 Echo Juliet Delta is on the air as Sierra Victor 8 slash Sierra Victor 1 Echo Juliet Delta from Cyros Island, that's an IOTA reference Echo Uniform 067, until the 11th of August. Activity will be on the 6 to 80 metre bands using SSB and RTTY and you can QSL to his home call. Hanez Sierra 53 Victor will be active as 9 Alpha 8 Charlie Victor from Kirk Island, that's Echo Uniform 136, until the 3rd of August. He'll only operate CW and you can QSL via EQSL only. Jan Papa Alpha 4 Juliet Juliet will be active holiday styly as 9 Alpha slash Papa 4 Juliet Juliet from Croatia between the 1st of August and the 30th of September. Expect him to operate mainly on digital modes and QSL via the home call, direct or via the bureau. Jim, Whiskey 2 Juliet Hotel Papa will be active as Victor 31 Tango Alpha from the Tenef Islands, that's November Alpha 123 in Belize until the 12th of August. It'll be operating SSB and maybe some digital and you can QSL via Echo Alpha 5 Golf Lima direct only. From the headquarters of the American Radio Relay League in Newington, Connecticut, this is ARRL The Doctor Is In, a bi-weekly podcast addressing common and some not-so-common technical issues in amateur radio. And now, here's your host, QST Editor-in-Chief Steve Ford, WB8IMY, and the doctor himself, QST Contributing Editor Joel Hallis, W1ZR. Hello and welcome to ARRL, the Doctor Is In podcast. I'm Steve Ford, WB8IMY. And I'm Joel Hallis, W1ZR. Hey, Joel, it's time to talk about balance. Or, if you listen to 40 Meter Phone, balance. I got, balance. My, I got my balin. Clarify that. Do you, do you know the correct pronunciation? It is well, balin, right? Well, it is a contraction of balanced to unbalanced. So, bal. Un. So it's not bailing. <laughs> not to me, I guess. Well, it depends. How would you say balanced? Yeah, I wouldn't say... Balanced? Balanced. Well, I mean, depending on what part of the country you're Maybe from. Maybe so. I, I guess, I guess if, if, if you would say balanced, then it should be a bal- bailing. <laughs> but if it's you say balanced, as I would, it well, should be balin. I well, would think. Define for me. Let's define our terms. What is a balin? A balin, by definition, is the uh, transition between a balanced electrical system and an unbalanced electrical system. So now the next question should be, so what are they? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> don't, don't leave us hanging here, Joe. Okay. So a balanced electrical system, typified by perhaps the, uh, the connections at the center of a center-fed dipole, is a system in which each side is the same potential above ground. Now, of course, they're not exactly the same. That one is going positive when the other is going negative, but they're both above ground. So at some instant, if one is at plus 100 volts, the other one is at minus 100 volts with respect mm-hmm. to ground. So they both are at the same potential with respect to ground, same magnitude of potential. An unbalanced system is one in which one side of the system is at ground potential and the uh, signal is applied with reference to ground. So an example of something like that would be a ground plane antenna in which mm-hmm. the one side of it is an artificial ground that would be hooked directly to the shield of a coax let's say and the other side is the let's say quarter wave monopole that gets connected 
to the center conductor of the coax. Or, as you say, monopole, but a vertical antenna, I mean, an HF vertical is an unbalanced antenna by that definition then, right? HF vertical, it's fed on the end, yes. Now, first of all, let's say people say, do you really need a balance? Well, you know, I guess I go back to the 50s starting in this business, and um, as a young lad, I'd like to say I started when I was two, but it's not really true. <laughs> now, that was before they invented balance. Well, uh, <laughs> They didn't call them that. I mean, that was that's the point. I guess before the World War II, almost all ham antennas were balanced and fed with balanced transmission lines, such as open wire line. And people didn't really have much in the way of pre-manufactured transmission lines. There was no uh, TV yet to speak of that had uh, twin lead. There may have been a little around, but hams mm-hmm. didn't tend to use that. And those balanced antenna systems would be connected to a balanced link in a link-coupled transmitter, which would be a kind of an adjustable impedance um, transformer that would tie into the transmitter output. And there was no need to worry about this, and nobody did. They worried about how well it was the uh, system was balanced, mm-hmm. and they looked at that by putting an RF ammeter in each of the two balance, each of the two sides of the balanced line. Yes. And if everything were perfectly balanced, you hit the key, the meters would show the same reading. So that was then. Now, what happened was a confluence of a couple things. The end of World War II and millions of miles, it seemed, of surplus RG8 coax at, on Cortland Street in New York and probably at Radio Rose in many other cities, combined with the beginnings of TV operation in which hams were finding themselves dealing with TV interference. Mm-hmm. Coaxial cable, by its nature, if operated properly, is has a shielding properties, which means that it will not couple to television antennas that it goes nearby. Mm-hmm. So, so there was a big push in the late 40s, early 50s to shield equipment, use shielded cables for everything, use coax cable for your antenna feeds. And people did that and just essentially replaced the open wire line with coax. That's right. And they hooked the coax to their dipoles. They found that, well, a half-wave dipole connected with coax worked pretty well. It, it, um, people weren't measuring SWR yet, um, mm-hmm. so they didn't know they had a problem, and everybody was happy. <laughs> <laughs> Ignorance is bliss. Ignorance can be bliss. And nobody had balance. After a while, people started noticing that some people had better results than others. Some people had more coupling from the coax to other systems than others. And what was happening was when you hook the coax to the antenna, you have an interesting phenomenon that takes place. Coaxial cable we think of as a two-conductor system, but really it's a three-conductor system. The coaxial mode, or what's called differential mode, exists between the outside of the inner conductor and the inside of the outer conductor. Remember, there's this thing called skin effect in oh, electric. Yeah. So with high-frequency right. currents tend to propagate on the outside surfaces of conductors. So within the coax cable, fields are set up between the inner conductor and the inside of the outer conductor, and they propagate down the coaxial cable. And if it's terminated properly, there's nothing on the outside of the coax because mm-hmm. the shielding and the skin effect keeps it that way, and that's what makes shielding work. Yes. Now, okay, let's move to the end where the antenna is. Now, we go to our dipole antenna. We hook the interconductor to one side of the dipole, as we did back then. We hook the coax shield to the other side of the dipole, and what happens? Well, we drive the current towards that load, but it isn't just a single dipole. What we have is we've also inadvertently connected the outside of the shield, which is completely independent of the inside of the shield. We've connected that... Uh to the other side of the dipole in parallel with the inside of the shield. Now, see, I never thought of it that way. Yeah, well, it's it's um, nobody did for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> but what happens is the current going towards the, call it shield side of the dipole, divides between the half of the dipole and the outside of the shield and comes down the outside of the shield. So no matter how good a job the shield was doing it, trying to shield things, it's completely circumvented by any current that flows on the outside of the shield. Oh, okay. And that's what's usually referred to as a common mode current because it's kind of common to the whole, the whole shield in effect is, or the whole coax is being, mm-hmm. um, sees this current. So uh, that current actually acts like part of the antenna or radiates as if the current on an antenna does. Yes. And um, is that good or bad? Well, it depends. I mean, sometimes having conductors radiate is a good idea if you're, if you.
Daily Minutes zijn dagelijks om 1900 uur te beluisteren op PI2 NOS en ochtends om half elf. Aanvullende informatie bij de uitzendingen is te vinden op www.pa0ete.nl. Wil verder gerust je tips, commentaar en desnoods priet praten naar xapenstaartjexdv.me. Dat is griezelig. Ja, echt wel. Zo dan. Maar niet zo griezelig als PA0ETE, als die zo dadelijk de inmelders weer te woord staat.